calling to order tonight's meeting of the police civilian accountability board study committee. Uh, Doug, if you can give the preamble, that would be great. This meeting is being conducted pursuant to the recent legislation passed uh, by the Commonwealth, which extends the ability of committees and commissions of the Commonwealth to meet um, online or remotely rather than meeting in person. The uh, same requirements as in previous meetings under emergency orders remain in place. All votes must be taken uh, by roll call. Uh, we should note that this meeting is being recorded uh, and transmitted over Zoom, that folks uh, who wanna participate uh, can, can do so, uh, but should take care to make sure that their screen name uh, reflects who they are. If folks don't wanna identify themselves, they don't have to. The easiest way to do that is to use the call-in feature which you can find on the agenda. You can also find um, the agenda online at the town's website, which not only has information on how to access the meeting, but also has information on uh, what the topics for the meeting are. Um, oh, with that, I think we should probably take a quick uh, attendance check uh, just to confirm all the members who are participating remotely. Would you like me to do that? Yeah, that would be great. Sanjay? Here. Michael? Here. Kathy? Roger's here, yes. Sorry. Mona? Here. Carlos? Here. Dill? Here. Uh, Chief? Julie? Here. Here. Oh, Elliot? Here. I believe that's Bob? Yes, it is, and he's here. Clarissa? Yes. And, I th and uh, obviously, uh, Laura. Yes, I'm here. And I will also note that uh, I'm present as well. So I think that covers all the uh, voting and non-voting members. Okay, great. Um, so thank you all for bearing with us as we um, deal with whatever technical issues we are having. Um, I'll, we'll try to make sure that's clearer for the next meeting. Um, the first thing on the agenda is to approve the prior minutes. Did everybody get the minutes that Sanjay sent of last, uh, the data last meeting, June 3rd's meeting? And I'm gonna share them on the screen Thank here. You. Um, can you guys see that now? Yeah. Okay. So do we have, did anybody have any corrections or things that I missed from last time around or fr from this meeting? I'll, I'll slowly scroll through here. Um, but given the time we're at, yeah. if, if I won't spend too long. So can somebody, does, will somebody make a motion to approve the minutes? <laughs> motion to approve the June minutes as presented. A second. Doug, do you mind taking the vote? You bet. Uh, Laura. Hey, yes. Sanjay. Yes. Michael. Yes. Kathy Rogers. Yes. Larissa. Abstain, I was not present. Mona. Yes. Carlos. Yes. Elliot. Yes. Bob. Yes. Did I miss anybody who's a voting member? It's unanimous. Uh, well, it's a unanimous vote with one uh, abstention. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so we thought it would be a good idea to sort of just make it routine that we start each meeting checking in whether anybody has any updates from their various constituencies they're representing. Um, I was going to, I think I, I'm going to start with Carlos because I think when we talked last time, uh, the, you hadn't met since our last meeting. So I wanted to give you the chance to check in with the um, diversity task group. Thank you. Yes. So let me start. <clears throat> and uh, I do have in front of me some notes and uh, uh, you know, I would like to maybe submit uh, so, some of these generic questions that were discussed, you know, uh, to to the committee. 
because it's not a matter of like, we're not gonna answer any of these questions today, but I think there's like some items that, you know, that we should, you know, uh, they were brought up <coughs> by the community and that we should just go back. And as we do the study, we just check to see if like, you know, make sure that we address some of these over time. So I'm gonna just tell you a few of the ones sure. that, that maybe we wanna comment on and, and, and share the spirit, but I will, I will submit in writing uh, uh, some of these. Um, one of the, the <coughs> first, uh, questions, suggestions that uh, that were brought up by the the, <clears throat> the diversity task group was the fact that you know maybe they you know there should be some effort maybe to have some education to you know to the community about what are the the multiple levels of oversight that we already have right so so just to say hey what is it that we have what is it that the federal government is can do for us what is the new state uh, bill can do for us and what is that already you know on the local level what are what are the things that are already in place? You know, is there, is there some quick document or something that we can just show? It's like, hey, this is, this is what it is. It doesn't have to be comprehensive, but uh, a little bit of education would be, would be interesting. Another point that was um, uh, brought up was the idea of safe space. And safe space, I mean, it was kind of both, not only about uh, the ultimate, uh, uh, you know, civilian review board, if, if one is uh, enacted, but it also in here, and how is it that, that, that we sure that there's a safe space for, you know, so there people can come over and just like, you know, communicate, you know, be themselves and then be, and this is a place where, where they can talk, right? And, uh, and they can do those, you know, do that in, in confidence. Um, and I'll just maybe do another one, which is a very interesting point uh, that, that was brought up. It's about the, the current legislation uh, that got passed at the state level where there is this idea of one of the uh, um, options that can happen at the end is to decertify, right? Or, or not certify police officers, right? And that, that it kind of <clears throat> what's interesting about that is like maybe that could be a very harsh penalty. And if it's like a harsh penalty, then how often is it going to be used, right? So, so the, the whole idea is just like, you know, it's like, you know, maybe. Uh, are there, you know, what are any other kind of like things that are like lower the, <clears throat> the certification that can actually be a, a real deterrence, right? Because if it's, if it's only the certification, that's the ultimate thing, it's not, never gonna, it's not gonna be used that often, then it's not a real deterrence, right? Um, another point somebody brought up was the, you know, that they would like to get an update about the use of body cams, you know, body cameras, you know, what is it? Is there any plans for, for the use and how is it that this can, can help uh, the process? Uh, but one of the main pieces and one of the themes that, that really uh, uh, we discuss at, at length is the idea of how is it that we can ha have an outreach to the community to make sure right, that we can, that we, you know, as a body here can hear all the voices in town. So that, you know, they're represented that we can kind of like, answer the questions that the people really want to answer and that be able to understand and see the real problem of like, you know, people in Arlington, you know, maybe, you know, uh, may have with this. And, and, and that's actually a, an, an overall, and I know that we, that's even an agenda item for today. So, so that is one of the, the main pieces that, that we were concerned about. Uh, around with that, uh, you know, similar to that is like, you know, well, what is it like, uh, the presence, for instance, of police officers at the meeting, how is it that that, uh, that you know, correlates to the idea of a safe space or, or uh, and, I, and I think that somebody brought up that, you know, Chief Flaherty, uh, when somebody, you know, she's part of, you know, the Rainbow Commission, sometimes, you know, she, you know, doesn't go to some of the meetings just to provide, you know, certain uh, sense of uh, space. Then uh, there were some other pieces here that were kind of very interesting um, uh, that, you know, somebody probably is like, you know, currently, you know, APD and, and the chief, they, they're really uh, looking at, at policy issues very deeply. And, and, and then the, the, the idea is like, how is it that, you know, they can then be institutionalized. So that for the future, right? You know, when, you know, the chief now becomes, you know, a great chief might leave us to for a for big APD or she retires, you know, so how is it that we can institutionalize this, this, this idea of like, you know, having some, some sort of a, of a review or you know of, of policy, so that was kind of like resonated with some of the members. And th the last point I, I just want to mention is uh, somebody brought up that 
the, you know, APD has really good training of the police officers. And that, that part maybe is not publicized. The community doesn't know the level of training that APD has. And that, you know, it's well beyond, I mean, some, somebody bring it up to saying like well beyond like many other uh, police uh, um, departments uh, around. And, and that that is one of the things that um, the baby should be, should, should be better uh, addressed. And, and that kind of resonates to one of the pieces that uh, we've talked before about what a civilian review or advisory board may, may help in this communication, in this, in this, in this community outreach. You know? So it's, it's, it's can be both ways, right? It can be a place where uh, a review board maybe you know, have inputs about policy, but it's also that may have may, may serve as a, a as a way to communication with the, you know with the community uh, as at all. So I will send this in the, uh, in writing uh, because there are many other points in here that I didn't mention right now, but uh, that uh, we should address uh, in its due you know time. And uh, and I don't know if you, if anybody would like to to make some comments or have further uh, questions. Doug, did you? I, I feel like you're going to comment on I, what's, is, were you going to say something about what we can send an email or? No, I think that, oh, okay. that I think that is that's it okay fine. for that to go in email. Yeah, we're, we're talking about it here in an open meeting. Uh, if, okay. if Carlos wants to transmit uh, the list of things that were um, forwarded to him or developed um, the diversity task group, I think that's fine. Okay. I also just wanted to comment that, um, I thought I had transmitted this, maybe I didn't. The um, summary, the PowerPoint presentation on the on the Justice Equity uh, uh, and Accountability Act and law enforcement, um, which covers things like the post has the ability to suspend, demand retraining, uh, you know, and and do any number of intermediary things before you talk about decertification. So that's something that I can transmit around. I'll send it off right now because I'll it. And it's also something that in theory we can post on the town's website. I'm glad to see that it got, that, that the committee is now sort of up and running on the town's website, but we still need to get some documents that have been used as reference uploaded there. So yeah. I'll send it around. Thank you. Um, is there anybody else who, uh, Clarissa. I see Clarissa. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think that the training, um, listing the training that the police officers get now is an excellent idea because recently in the Mugar Woods, there was an incident where there was incredibly, um, luckily, an incident that resulted in no violence, but there was a homeless person who had a BB gun that looked like a rifle. And he pointed it at one of our police officers who'd had the training to step back and um, really deal with obviously a man that had mental issues. And it was a wonderful example of our police force because they really work hard at, at trying to understand the mental illness component. So I think the more that we get that word out to the general public, the better we will be doing a service to the community because I think with the current national tenor, I think that people are more defensive about our police force and we are doing a lot of really good things. So thank you. Great, thank you. Did anybody else um, have an update from, like Kathy, did you have anything from the Human Rights Commission? Nope. No, and I'm looking, oh, Elliot. Um, we sent an email to uh, our principal, Dr. Janger, about uh, like we were talking about last meeting, maybe having students input our like anonymous stuff. And um, he said in email that he, it sounded great. Obviously, like we don't have any of the details yet, so it's kind of hard to plan stuff. But he said he agreed with it and could send a note out, like when we have to. When detail. we have some information about where people can provide that input. Yeah. Great. Thank you. I'm glad. I'm glad we have that. Um, Clarissa, were you? Jillian and I will. Jillian. Elliot, Jillian, um, Jillian and I will help you with that, if that helps. 
Um, I think it's a great idea and I'm glad you've already re reached out to Principal Jenger. Um, and, you know, I think in the fall, that might be a really good idea. And if you and Mona want to reach out to me this summer and figure out what kind of format it should be at, um, we want to have the students feel comfortable. That's the most important thing. And, um, you know, what kind of format would really help them be as honest as they could be, it would be just terrific. So please reach out to me and I'll help you organize it. And thank you for doing that extra work. Um, this is a good segue if nobody else has any updates to the next item on our agenda. So let me just check in if anybody else had any updates. Uh, Michael, anything? Okay. Um, so the next item on the agenda is, oh, Doug. Is your, your hand is raised, is that? Oh, I'm sorry. No, oh. no, I, I meant to, I should put it down. Sorry. Okay. Um, okay, so the next item on our agenda is to talk about outreach. And um, we got to the, I think, you know, we were talking at our last meeting about, we had a report from, we, Carlos told us a little bit more. We talked about, we talked, we talked more about the different, Whoa, that's my laptop. Um, policies, kinds of uh, review boards, review bodies. And what just we're talking about how it makes one thing we have to do is have community input and outreach. And given our timeline, we need to start that sooner or re sooner rather than later. Unf uh, I had asked Karen Bishop because she mentioned listening sessions. I had asked her if she would talk a little bit about how she's run them in the past. Unfortunately, she can't join us tonight. Um, so I wanted to start a discussion about brainstorming ideas for outreach and talking about uh, forums, whether, you know, sort of like Elliot was talking about um, and timeline for that. And I, I talked to Doug earlier. I, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, Jill, but he thought, given what you have done, that you might have some initial thoughts on how we start this process. Yeah. Um, so it's a lot, <laughs> um, especially if you're looking to get input from people you don't already get input from. Right. <laughs> um, so that means being physical, going into neighborhoods, going into businesses, asking for help. Also, things need to be translated. We need to figure out if we can have interpreters present at these, me at these meetings to hear from people who- 73% of all chickens are- um, So there's a lot that goes into that and that also takes some funding. <laughs> so I don't know what this group has, if we have anything. Um, so those are the types of things that need to be thought about before putting in place a date and a time because having all of those back end logistics figured out and then the date and the time and the place is what um, would come next. But also figuring out um, spaces you know, having it in town hall, probably not ideal. You already have people who don't want to go there. It's not an inviting space. So figuring out places around town that are comfortable for people to be able to show up to and want to discuss things, but also making sure that the folks in the room, I think it would make sense to have a few individuals from this group, not everyone present, um, because that's intimidating in itself. <laughs> So just thinking about how to lay it out is where I think we need to start. Okay, that is a lot. <laughs> Can I offer something in supplement? Yes, please. I don't want to step on uh, uh, Jill's uh, toes or, or, um, or Anne's or anybody else's, but um, I, I did note that one of the things, by the way, um, Clarissa and I did prepare, if, if you guys want, we have time, okay. a review of the audit model of civilian review. Um, so uh, we have a presentation that, that, that I can give if, if folks want, but I know that, that the major focus on this meeting is community out, outreach. Uh, but I want to note that one of the things that I looked at 
was uh, a similar process that's been happening in Somerville um, that they have some preliminary reporting about, but also some different ways in which they uh, garnered uh, community input that we've also talked about in terms of different information surveys. And so it might be valuable to um, speak to uh, somebody over in Somerville. I think they have a legislative and policy analyst for the city council that might uh, give you give folks some perspective on on what what they did and 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 maybe help save a little bit of, of time and energy in terms of you know were things successful were things not um, you know how did they structure like their information survey uh, they might be willing to share that with us I tried to find it but it, it's not active anymore so I just wanted to share that okay thank you yeah um that's really interesting um. In terms of like, if we want to have smaller, what I think I'm still unclear about how we have like meetings that are not this kind of meeting where we're all here and it's a like more of a formal open meeting. Um, and I agree with what Jill has said and, and it's certainly the feedback I've had from other community members that there's a lot uh, we need to do to make people feel welcome, invited, if they show up to make them feel like they actually can talk about it instead of just like listening to us talk. And so I, I just wanted to check in with you, Doug, about what, if anything, we have to be mindful of as we think about that process. Sure. So if you're all together or there's a quorum of you, you should assume that you're having a meeting. Okay. Um, you have the ability to um, have a forum that's not a meeting, but I generally think that, again, if you're going to have a quorum and there's any possibility that you're going to discuss the substance among yourselves and basically share your perspectives, then it's just wise to post it uh, and treat it mm -hmm. like a meeting. That doesn't mean that you can't have... Um, members of this committee, you can't, well, but first you can't have this committee develop a set of um, things that it wants to know and uh, the forums that it wants to have and the way that it wants to engage the community and have representatives of this committee there in less than a quorum. Um, it's not really a subcommittee, so I'm not super worried about that because what you're really trying to do is send some folks out in perform some engagement in the various constituencies that many of you are well acquainted with, as well as the constituencies of the town, which are not well acquainted with. So I don't have a lot of concerns as long as we're not talking about a quorum of folks. And as long as you're clear on what's happening, if you're gonna have like a big event and there's gonna be seven of you there, then you should post it as a meeting, almost as a redundancy. Sometimes that happens with our larger forums. And that's a good thing because it just increases transparency and accountability in the event that, hey, um, you know, uh, Elliot starts talking about, you know, an experience that he's had or a perspective that he shared just as a way of trying to get things going with uh, some folks that you want to hear from. But he's giving a perspective and there's six of you there. And then all of a sudden you've got an open meeting on it. So again, keep it under the quorum and I think you're in good shape. Okay. I have a tough time imagining that you're going to send out more than three or four members right. of the committee if you're going to be engaged in sort of smaller group listening sessions. Jill, has that been pretty consistent with your engagement experience? Yeah, I mean, I also, I don't have the issue because most of the stuff I'm doing, I'm not doing it with commissions. I'm doing it by myself. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't have that problem of open meeting because I'm not, it's just me. <laughs> <laughs> what, what about, so I assume the, I, I, maybe I'm wrong. I'm, we, Jill brought up a point of like what it, what resources it takes us to, like, do we can, do we have, res like through the town, if we wanna print a flyer, if we want to have something translated, 
Like, is that available to us, Doug? I think what I would do is I would request it. Um, mm -hmm. You've got, you know, you're a committee of town meeting, so you don't have an inherent source of funding. Right. Um, I think we'd have to identify funds from one of a couple of different places. Um, some of them are gonna be tighter than others. The select board doesn't have a lot of discretionary funds, but I think we probably look uh, at health and human services mm -hmm. um, to see if there are you know, funds that are frankly probably set up for similar ideas for the Human Rights Commission or the Rainbow Commission. I mean, I would be, I would be hopeful that, that folks would be generous and willing to, willing to share some of, 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 of what we have available. But it, it can, translation, translators in particular are, are probably your big expense to get more done. Okay. Um, Laura, yeah. I actually, I do a lot of public meetings as I work in the Gateway Cities, I have a wonderful translation um, company, a very small company in Boston that does our translations for us. So when we get to that, I can give you the contact information. Okay. And it's really important not only to have the translator there, but to have the um, messages go out in the different languages that we right. um, expect and, and figure out. I would think maybe the public libraries would be a very good place because an after hours for the libraries. Um, the summertime is really not a good time to get people to come out because they're, you know, they're having a lot of stuff with their family. But maybe starting the third week of September would be good. Um, and again, you know, with Mona and Elliot trying to set up something in the high school. I agree with what Jill has said and what Doug has said. I think the smaller the group, the better. We don't want to be intimidating. The most important thing for us is to have people that are coming to see us be comfortable. So maybe we set up two or three listening sessions, see how it goes, then do a feedback on those listening sessions, and then come back to the committee and say, this worked or this did not work. But I think it's a very, you know, I've done this for, I'm afraid to say 40 years. <laughs> and it's, you know, you have to listen and it's active listening. So I think it's really something that we need to think about very carefully. Um, I agree. I think- Can I, can yeah, I? Sanjay, yeah, please. so I um, agree with, with a, a lot of what was just said, right? I, I wanna sort of, um, highlight for us our timeline here though, right? Yes. And make yeah. sure that we keep that in mind as we're considering our options, right? Um, I think we talked at earlier meetings about the fact that, you know, really we should expect to have, um, we should expect to be coming to some sort of agreement about what our major recommendations are going to be by November. Right, um, and that was something we had discussed at our earlier meetings, right? Um, while I do think that it is uh, easier to get feedback not in the summer, um, I don't think our timeline affords us the luxury of waiting for September. Um, I, sorry, Jillian has something to add to that. I'm sorry, I know I'm going ahead of you, Carlos, but I'm just gonna say from the beginning, this expectation and timeline was not realistic at all. Like part of this, when it went through, I don't think it was done correctly. I don't think if there's any way that this can be reassessed, if we can figure out what's actually gonna work for us and actually be helpful for the community, I think that would be better than trying to force it to have something by November. Cause I don't think from my experience already, the summer you're gonna have low turnout. You're not gonna hear from people. I'm already experiencing that with programs and things that people have asked me for and they're not showing up. So it's just going to be a waste of effort on our at, on our end if, if we're not timing it the right way. And I don't think it should be rushed just to meet what was written. That's just my two cents. So, right, so, so then that, what, right, what that means, right, is that we have to go to um, Two town meeting next year asking for another year right that that is what that would mean 
Um, and uh, yeah, I, I um, I'll I'll leave it at that. I, I, yeah, I, Carlos had something to say. So maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I mean, I, I think that it's not a foregone conclusion that you know that the timeline is not going to work because maybe in November we find something that's going to work. We don't know that yet. So, so we shouldn't start with, with, with the negative in front of us. But how is it that we can give us a chance that by November we have something? And I think we need to basically uh, um, uh, multitask and we say, hey, you know, maybe to get the, the input that we need to get, we need to get it in September. But that doesn't mean that us during the summer, we can investigate all these different options that, that we have. We go deeper into, into the Massachusetts Act. How is it that that can help us? We can go deeper into like, you know, how is it that we can have programs with, with the police chief to, to educate ourselves and educate the community about stuff. So there's all this stuff that we can start doing it. And then when we get the questions like, oh, maybe we'll already have the answer for some of those. And maybe we'll have, maybe we'll recognize in November, it's like, oh my God, we were way off. <laughs> we're trying to, trying to solve this problem when really now that we ask the people, we, the problem that we want to solve is a different one. We can discover that. And then at that point say, yeah, sure, you know, maybe we need a different year. But I think that there's a lot of stuff that we can keep going and studying and thinking ourselves and trying to reach out uh, to wherever it is around in the summer and see what it is. But I agree with you, Sanjay, that, that we need to be mindful that it's like, <laughs> There's, there's a pace that we need to have to discover things, and, but I think that we can multitask, you know. We can, uh, a dog can present to us the staff, we can ask people, we can talk to Somerville people, we can do all these different things even before we don't have all the questions because then we'll be prepared to answer the questions when they come over. So I think that, you know, we can still do it potentially, <laughs> but I don't know. <laughs> but maybe I'm just an optimist. Uh, no, I appreciate that optimism, I, yeah. Um. Jill, do you, putting aside the timeline that we're sort of at the moment stuck with, I think even my opinion is I'm like, I think everything you said makes total sense. I'm also really concerned about if we don't go back to town meeting with something more concrete or at least like we've really made like some headway towards something like I'm worried we might not get another year. <laughs> so part of what we need to do is, um, is start. And I guess what I'm asking, is there, if we wanted to start doing something small over the summer, do you have thoughts about what would be the most realistic? If there's a, a, a constituency that is more responsive or you know, a good place where we could start? Um, well, I guess my first question is, are you looking to do these things in person or virtual <laughs> or both? Because that's also like, I'm basically starting at the beginning. I have not done a single thing <laughs> in real life. So all of this is also a learning curve for me. Um, and so also finding people and outreach is something that's on my to-do list for the summer, but I have not had the time or the capacity to even think about how to approach it. And that was supposed to happen last week, but that didn't happen. So, um, so I think, you know, knowing if you want to do a mix of in-person or virtual that will help us, but that, that's up to you all. Um, but again, virtual limits some people, in-person limits some people, so. And I don't know where it would be starting. I think finding out who we don't already hear from. Right, and, that's the huge, I mean, this right. is. <laughs> that's like, the problem. <laughs> that's right. a problem we all have. Um, <laughs> and no one's got the solution yet. <laughs> so. Can I, can I make two suggestions? Yes. So one is, I think that um, we should do an assessment of what data may have already been gathered that we haven't yet 
reported on, right? So we received the basic data from the Arlington Police Department about stops and complaints and all that kind of stuff. And one of the big questions is, you know, um, what, 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 what do we not know uh, about people who might not be comfortable making those complaints to the police department? But we've obviously, in a couple of different formats and forums, collected some feedback in um, a couple of different capacities over the last couple of years. So, um, I, and I know that we, we did, or not we, I believe Envision Arlington sent out a survey that had some relevant questions uh, that might inform this committee. I can't remember if we've already talked about this. I know that that hasn't been finalized yet or the, the, the results of that aren't, 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 haven't, haven't been put out yet, but that might be something that would be helpful for understanding these gaps a little bit better. Um, and there may be some other more substantive stuff that we can try to draw from the Human Rights Commission, um, from other um, forums and, and meetings that we've had. The other thing that I guess I would just put out for the committee to think about is what do you want your public input to do? So th there's four or five, depending on how you articulate it, basic models of civilian review. And they all have fairly cognizable set of features and issues. You can start, I, I think that what I, the sense I'm getting from most of you is that you could start from, you'd, you'd rather get input before you start making those choices about what you think fits better. But the other option is, is that you can sort of start to develop a picture of what you think makes sense and try to have uh, community feedback that that you know fits into the options that you think are uh, more feasible in Arlington based on you know the input that you received so far and what you know about them. Because if you have everything on the t if you're starting from scratch um, and you're gathering the widest net possible, there's obviously advantages to that. But if you do some work now and you focus on having more of your community engagement after you have a more focused set of proposals, that's one way to approach it. I'm not saying that it's the right way to approach it. I guess I'm just saying that, that, that that's one way that you might use the time that you have now um, and focus your community engagement. So that if you went to town meeting and you said, um, we developed uh, two or three options that we thought made sense for Arlington. We presented them for community engagement feedback. We answered questions and the answer is, we don't feel like this is ready for prime time because the community feedback told us that it wasn't. Uh, we need more time, but this is our report. These were our, 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 our not recommendations, but our ideas that we brought to the community. Um, our, or you may get the, hey, these were our three options. Um, the community feedback was that some combination of A and B is what seemed to people seem to respond to well and, 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 and that's what we're recommending to town meeting. And again, I, I'm cognizant of the fact that, that not everybody on this committee agrees on what the scope of the committee is and all that kind of stuff. I'm just sort of offering one, one way that you can work over the summer. Right. Uh, community engagement is gonna be difficult. Thanks. Um, can I just to follow up on something you said, Doug, um, or maybe Mike, Michael is the person to ask about the Envision Arlington survey data. Like, is that something we can have access to? Um, you know, where is that? Where is Envision Arlington in like thinking about the data they've collected and when it can be public? Um, I can find out for you. I don't have the answer for you, but Doug, is that something I can share with the group? Um, I mean, if, if I find out the answer to that question, what's the way that I can share that? I can just share that with the group? Well, I, I would share it in advance of a meeting uh, as like an uh, agenda item, you know, assuming that I, I just don't want to step on Envision Arlington's toes. When Envision Arlington's ready to, you know, make the results of, of their survey known, I, I, I understand that this body doesn't dictate what they do and don't do. So I'm respectful of that. But I think you just put it as an agenda item and say, in advance of this meeting, I'm sharing this data. 
Okay. So, so I'll do that. Okay. Um, so what if we plan, I mean, I, I think that, but what Doug and Carlos are both saying is sort of similar in that we can be working on multiple things at a time, in which case we need to figure out who's doing what. Um, I don't know if, so we've heard from Carlos with about like the um, sort of policy type bodies. Maybe, maybe this would be a good time to hear, to have Doug and Clarissa's presentation well, or. I, I think we need to get a little bit more concrete about what our, our plan is, right? Um, okay. And I think, um, I think we actually we've, we've come to a pretty decent place in my, you know, I'm feeling good about what sort of Doug and Carlos have really sort of pointed us to, um, which is, you know, let's use the summer to really come up as a committee with policy recommendations based on, you know, research and, and whatever, right? Um, and then test those against community feedback in the in the fall, right? And and I uh, the other thing that I would say is I think that it it's worth attempting to do a first some sort of community something over the summer um, not because we're going to get um not because we're going to get great response but because we're going to learn how to gather that community input community input by doing that that one form over the summer right how, i mean whatever small group or or whatever right um i think you know having developed the questions that we want to or prompts that we want to sort of give to people right and having that go out in the wild once even if we don't get a lot of response right i think that will that could really help improve the quality of what we do in september yeah i, I would agree testing the questions with a e even if we found a group just put a group together of people who are advocates and that, that are the usual suspects just to kick the tires i think that would be very helpful So I, sorry if that's a, but does that sound like a, a decent way to head with that? And I think that comes back to what Laura was saying about, okay, now we need to probably actually assign some people um, to do both sides of that. Right. Um, and, and we, you know, yeah. So. Um, no, I agree. I mean, I think to, I think you're right. It's like a soft opening. Yes. Um, but so I guess the first question is if we're gonna do something like that, are we gonna do it virtually or hybrid or in person? I, I, I'm biased. I've done almost nothing in person yet. Um, so. <laughs> I uh, second that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's just me. Um, so I'll put that out there and other people can say different things. <laughs> I think it's very important to do it in person. I think the personal connection um, is the most important thing about, again, I'm an old lady. I've been doing this for a long time and people respond to other humans. And I know Zoom is a wonderful thing that we've had for a year and a half, but we need to get on, get on with our lives and go and sit with people and have them talk to us and, and we need to listen. And Sanjay and Carlos, I know you're comfortable with Zoom, but I think this is an important issue and we really need to, you know, even if we sit in the libraries, all three libraries by ourselves and have our, our points, and nobody turns up, then we know that we have not succeeded. But I think the most important thing is to say, we're here, we wanna listen, we want you to be comfortable. And, um, you know, a lot of people don't have the technology that, that we have. I mean, it took me to almost 20 minutes to get on this call. So <laughs> um, I just think it's, it's important to think about who 
we're talking to. I think though we're that, the, I mean, whatever we do first, like we don't, I, I imagine that we don't do e either thing exclusively. I think it would be mm -hmm. a mistake to <clears> not <throat> make use, you know, even if people agree that an in-person meeting is important and I don't disagree with that. I'm just more concerned with how unusual that is for most people right now and getting people to show up uh, when they have to leave their houses. You know, part of what's happened in town over the last 15 months is that we've gotten a lot more engagement, I think. That's been my sort of anecdotal experience from attending meetings virtually and town meeting virtually and all of that. But I think the, the question is, you know, we're not, I don't think we're deciding one over the other. We have to decide what are we gonna do first um, and what can we achieve first? And um, I don't know, I think I lean towards doing something virtual just because I think, you know, there are still this, the pandemic, you know, as the parent of two small unvaccinated children, I'm, you know, hesitant to like go full force into thinking that people want to be in person and will show up, especially in a time of year where getting people to show up at all is difficult. Michael? Is it, is it possible to do some kind of hybrid thing? Or, I mean, I think there are meetings where Good ball. There are people in. Um, there are people who are um, do meetings like this. That there are people who are in front of people who are in the audience, and there are people who are on Zoom, and it allows for both. Has, so, anyone, yeah. has, has anyone gone to anything like that? Carlos, did you? Yeah. So uh, I mean. Maybe we should do both. Like we don't have to be. It's not doesn't have to be the same meeting, right? Because maybe maybe right. a, I, I think Michael, you bring something interesting there. Because yes, I think that that technology can be there, but maybe we should have both. Maybe we should have two or three of us that can go and visit some people in person, and then we should have a Zoom one with three or four or five other people in there, so that you can reach different constituencies, people that are not ready to to go out there that they don't want to, you know, but then they want to talk and, and be heard, and then some people that. You know they're really tired of Zoom, or or they don't even you know don't have the technology ready. And and but the the, the main question I have, and I don't know, Jillian, like what are the constituencies that, that we want to do? What are can we start formulating? What are the groups that we want to reach out? Uh, can we draw upon the the people they know that the communities that we already know? Michael, do you have a great idea? Maybe we just have like you know the usual suspects, you know, and that one that can be hybrid or on Zoom, right? But how can, can we have at least one meeting, which is like a real reach out there, you know, some going to, to some place where, you know, we want to, but I don't know where, you know, so who, who can start coming up with that, that list? Um, I would say the list is a mix of things. So contacting folks who are active in the religious interfaith community cultural groups, I would say go outside or use already established commissions to use their networks. I mean, that's because I haven't been able to do the outreach I want to, that's what I rely on right now. Um, the school system, getting messages out that way. Um, and then other local resources. So if you want to do something in person, you know, if we have a flyer, putting it in grocery stores, putting it in Walgreens, putting it in CVS, places that people, everyone has to go to, <laughs> um, and using the library as well. Um, but I would say the interfaith community is definitely the number one place to start. Um, I guess part of, I when I heard you talk, Jill, when you were talking earlier, I was I, I thought what I heard you saying was that in terms of small groups, we would also want to do them in a like targeted way where we're meeting with like, I guess I'm, I'm trying to think of how we make sure we're creating spaces that are safe or as safe as we're capable of making them 
that seems sort of in conflict with like putting flyers in Walgreens. And I don't know, mm -hmm. so I don't know what the best. What, I mean, and that's what you need to decide if you want to have a large open forum that's invited for everyone or have multiple sessions, like you can do small targeted groups in addition to a large come everybody. Um, so it's figuring that out. Like how many of these do you want to do? It's, it's a lot of work. So yeah. <laughs> that out is key and that's how you can start to target um, the different groups of folks and, and where you're gonna post things. Um, so it's, I think that's a discussion here. Like what's an idea of, right. do you wanna do two large groups and then focus on five small groups? Like I don't, I don't know what everyone is. Right, yeah. Wants to do or has the capacity to do. And I'm thinking additionally other, like I'm thinking about the Human Rights Commission, their monthly coffee chats. Like that's something that's simple. It's a couple of hours that in person it was at a coffee shop or wherever outside. Um, now it's on Zoom, but very low turnout, but also considering the timing because you need to think about people and their work schedules. Right, yeah. Not traditional work schedules. Um, mm -hmm. And that's some of the complaints I do get. I can't attend this because it's always at this time on this day and I don't have childcare, <laughs> like those types of things. Um, so yeah. I have a suggestion. Why don't we do what Jill is suggesting and reach out to the um, faith community, number one. I think that's a great idea. And then see how they want us to deal with them over the summer. And then again, you know, have a couple of sessions with them if they want it in person or if they want it on Zoom, we defer to them and then see how we're doing. And, and in July and maybe in August, we go back to the Human Rights Commission and see what they wanna do. And that will give us some, I, two ideas of what, you know, what kind of forums we wanna have in the future in the fall when we want to get more input. Does that make sense? What do people think? Sanjay? I have no objection with that particular thing. I think that honestly, right, I think it's it's more important we identify who wants to take the lead right. on this part of it. And, and honestly, you know, for the first one, whatever they're most comfortable with, whatever they have the connection to mm -hmm. for the first one, right. Do that. Right. And then um, <clears throat> from there, we can expand to making that outreach wider right. for the fall. So um, if we had, uh, I'd like to figure out who's doing it. And then yeah. I think that can inform the next decision. So, yeah, have, have we, are we deciding that we're working this summer or for the next few months on community input and putting content aside or are we, do we see ourselves, we're a pretty big group. I mean, you know, it's, it's a good size number. Is there any interest in having part of the group move forward with, you know, identifying options and then a, another group working more on the community outreach, which each person, you know, may go towards, you know, be more attracted to one of those two things that that speaks to his or her strengths. I I think that that's um, I think the I think that's what we should do, you know, and I think that's sort of what Doug and Carlos were suggesting when they talked about like we can be we can be working on multiple things at once. And you're right to divide that out in terms of what people's strengths are makes sense. So is there anybody who wants to step up to try to organize out a first outreach something? Um, I mean, Clarissa, is that something that you would wanna do? Um, I don't mind le leading the session, but I'm really not a religious person. 
So I have no um, ties to the um, faith community, I'm afraid to say. I'm a lapsed Catholic and really an agnostic. So I don't mind leading the, the in session stuff, but I'm, I'm not somebody who has those connections at all. I'm sorry. And so I'll, I'll say the opposite, right? I, I've already <laughs> taken on a chunk. No, I've already taken on a chunk of the policy thing to mm -hmm. report back to you all on. So I don't think I have the bandwidth to lead that sort of thing, but I do have some faith connections that I could perhaps Great. help you with, right? Thank you. <laughs> so, so if you want to lead that, that part of it, I can give you a little bit of that. That would be great, Sanjay. I'd yep. love that. Yep. So the goal would be to have something- This summer, yeah. This summer in whatever format that wh whoever you- Yeah, whatever the- Will work best. Yeah. And to have several people from, you know, not too many- Yeah, people, absolutely. Like three Maybe, of us. Yeah, three of us. Sanjay, myself, and anybody else who wants to be joined. I mean, I think that we need to, I mean, we need to take the burden off Jillian because she's a very busy woman. She ran one of the best Juneteenth um, celebrations I've ever been to on Saturday. There were too many speeches and not enough music. <laughs> but um, the speeches were all given by my friends. So what can I say? but the music was beautiful. So we need to take the burden off her. And Sanjay and I can work together and anybody else that wants to join us, I would love to have them. I think that um, Karen is, I don't know in terms of which communities she's most interested in, but she's definitely somebody who is interested in the outreach sure. sort of thing. So I, sure. I'm happy to follow up with her. That would be great, well. that would be great. Um, Bob? When, when you do this, how do you open up with people? Do you ask them questions as to how, how, do, you, how do you define what you're looking for mm -hmm. from them or get them to talk about something? Um, no, you for know, example, you know, Bob, I've done, I've been do doing these public meetings my entire career, mostly you talk about what the charge of the committee is. And you say, we're here today to listen to your concerns. And then you basically are quiet. And you turn to people and say, you know, you came tonight to tell us what you think. And then you just listen and you take notes and, and you know, I think the personal connection is very important because if you're not there and I mean, you know, I, I am tired of Zoom meetings, but I love public meetings. And I think if you're sitting there with a person, they're much more apt to talk about their own experiences. I don't expect anybody that's been traumatized in any way to come to our first meetings. I think that that is no, I think we're gonna be talking to people that are advocates and that's fine. We need to hear what they have to say and what their concerns are. I mean, it's, this is a very important issue, not just in Arlington, but in Massachusetts and all over the country. And we need to listen because there are a lot of, an awful lot of people that are very concerned and we wanna make our community be the best it can be. Um. Okay, so I mean that sounds like a good first plan in terms of starting uh, out some outreach. Um, oh, it looks like uh, Clarissa Kathy also is saying that the Human Rights Commission has a list of the various faith communities that yeah. she can provide to help get started there as yeah, well. Yeah, and I think Sanjay's connection because he already has it is where we start and. You know, I know a lot of the, I have a lot of religious friends, thank goodness. Um, and a lot of the people in this community are, are wonderful faith people. And so none of them are 
you know, we just, we are a welcoming community. We want to make, keep it that way. So let's start with one, see how we do and do it through Sanjay's connection and then reach out to the other um, faith communities. Um, okay, so in terms of the, tan the other work that we want to start pushing forward on, what do, can we, do we have a goal or does anybody has, have people thought about what the goal is as we collect this research? Do we want, you know, to start drafting something that talks about what these different options are, even though we haven't, without <clears throat> making a decision, without, you know, coming to the conclusion. Does that make sense? Yeah, I see a couple. I, I see a few head nods. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but I see Michael has his hand up. Yeah, yeah, just, a, just a question. So I think Doug identified there are like three or four different kinds of models that are existing now. And so is it just sort of laying out what those features are and then say, and then kicking the tires when we come back together, just sort of getting clarity on, on, on what those are or and or whether we would want to do something different. Is that is that what the work is? Is that what the second piece seems I, like? I think so. All right. I know Carlos collected some information. So and and, and Doug, you would have access to some of the, those other models that you could share. I mean, I, I would be happy I would be happy to work with someone or some a group of people this summer just looking at those models and just organizing the information so that we have something to respond to. If that's what the work is, I'm, I, I'm just getting clarity about what we mean. I would be very interested in that work as well, Michael. Is that, is that what we're saying with that piece of the work is? Catherine, it would be great to work with you if that's what the work is. I don't know. I mean, I feel like a soldier that's just ready to be giving, you know, I, 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 wanna, I wanna do work, I wanna get involved. I just need someone to give me a direction. I, I don't, you what to, yeah. <laughs> well, no, I just, I mean, there are leaders and then there are those that are followers or those that, you know, want to do the work. I'm, I'm a kind of roll up your sleeve kind of girl. And I just, I want to, I want to do that. I want to feel useful to this really important task. And if we came up with this fairly quickly, because it, it, it might just work, how could that, Doug, how could we share this information with the group so that, you know, uh, I imagine uh, the way I imagine this work might be is that if there are these three or four models, and, and we'd have to check with you about what those are, and and then just well, sort of break it down. The, 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 think, the, 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 that could be done, I don't know. And Kathleen, maybe you and I could sort of break things down as a first cut you know, in a month's time or, or with someone, I mean, Carlos, we, I might just draw on you because you have a good mind for okay. that. Yeah, I would it, love to, to be, you know, partner with, with both of you and then when we can basically it, just get together and get, you know, and, and, stuff, and, and, talk, the stuff that we have, we, you know, and we, you know, dissect all the stuff, ask the questions and stuff, and then come back to the community. Hey, this is uh, our picture of all these pieces. Let's start figuring out what, well, what, what this is this thing we have. Yeah, it gives yeah, us something what we have and yeah. that'll be great. But I think so we sort of started that two meetings ago and yeah. we broke there was Carlos Carlos's presentation he gave us their Doug is ready to talk about auditing and monitor was that was that right Doug auditing and monitoring right. so Carlos gave us a terrific overview of some of these primary models. And then to my recollection, we assigned uh, different folks uh, models to sort of explore in greater depth. Right. Uh, Carlos, I know you already got started on a lot of the data and he and I talked about it and also talked about some of the regional um, things that are happening in some of our neighboring cities in particular. I'm prepared to talk about uh, audit auditing models along with uh, Clarissa whenever you guys want, whether it's tonight or some other night. Uh, I don't recall how we divided up the rest of the major models. I think it was in, sort of investigative audit and um, review, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Oh, is that your memory? 
and I have I have investigative. Okay, sorry. Yeah, no, that's okay. But, and and but we've not sort of put all the materials side by side. We've heard a report, but we've not right. captured it on on, on right. paper. Right. So, so there's an important step about how how, how do we put it side by side. So right. it's and important to share. Maybe we should list, listen to um, or look at Doug's PowerPoint. Okay. Because that's one of the, I mean, we have Carlos is a now look at Doug's. And then, I mean, I think, I don't think we're there to look at them side to side yet. But uh, Doug has a really good presentation. I think that also, just before we do, I, I think this might be a good time for that. Before the other thing, the other things we were going to talk about was that Jillian had talked about sort of trying to look at different methods, different, um, not methods, uh, ways of- Ways of sourcing complaints. Ways of sourcing complaints. And I volunteered to help, but we haven't actually done that in large part because Jillian has too much work to do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, maybe, maybe Jill, if we, maybe you and I can have a conversation separately and I can just like pick I, I have more time than you do so if like we can sort of you I can pick your brain and try to do the more time consuming part of the work um I think the other thing that we that Doug has talked about before is um sort of next to all of this is to look at what other towns that we have something in common with have done already so i think doug you said like one of them would be brookline is that right that's correct so yeah so I, if, i'm not wedded to giving this presentation tonight but i do have a few notes in it that might be helpful for framing things okay um, i'm not trying to push it I, i'm just letting you know that I, the way that i see it is is that this body needs to sort of get an understanding and examine what are some of the common models you don't have to use any of them you could use a hybrid right. model you could come up with something entirely different and new. Um, and then there's probably a set of eight to 10 common things that you have to make decisions about. Is this body gonna be fully independent? Is this body gonna have the subpoena power? Is this body going to make recommendations before or after the police department does any internal professional standards review? If that's something you wanna do. There are, so I think that the first step is, here's the models. Everybody has gotten a chance to absorb a little bit of it. What models seem to make sense would fit in given this community input that you also wanna gather about, I think Carlos has put it well, where are the gaps, right? Where are the gaps that we, that, what, what, what are people not feeling confident about uh, with respect to community concern relative to their police department? Um, and then finally, you have to drill down on some of the very specific choices you have to make um, about, you know, um, if we've talked about an investigative model, that's your most expensive model. You need professional staff to execute a model like that. Um, you need to house that somewhere. You need to have an anticipation that you're going to be able to both fund and justify that expense, things like that. So um, I, I think that I think that you guys are outlining a, a great sort of general outline. So I guess I was thinking if in terms of trying to get people to take, I want, I do think if you're, how, how much time do you need to give us your overview? I can uh, give a pretty short one. I can do it in I think 10 minutes if, okay. uh, if everybody wants the sort of quick and quick, quick version of it, just for the purposes of informing folks and not, and going a little light on some of the details. So I was, go ahead. I was just, can I suggest that we set our, our summer meetings, right? Because okay. we have not done that or at least attempt yeah. to set the number yes. and frequency. And then um, we can, right, then hopefully move to Doug's presentation, Doug and Clarissa's presentation and have a fair amount of time for that. Sure. Does that so. sound reasonable to folks? Because I, I think we've covered what we're doing outreach-wise, at least for now. Yeah. So. 
I, I would like to suggest um, just given the amount of stuff information we have to cover and you know the number of things that we want to get done here um, that we actually attempt to meet um, more than twice during the summer um, and, yeah. and with the recognition that we may not get uh, you know, as long as we can get a quorum, um, and we may not get everybody f just because that's the nature of summer anyway. Um, but I, I, you know, I'd hate to see us lose steam. Um, and, and so I would suggest either three or four meetings over the course of the summer. Again, with the recognition that not everybody's going to make all of them. Right. Which puts us at this point at like if we did four meet if we tried to do four meetings before September. I'm looking at my calendar that's about every two weeks how do people feel about that i mean i'm fine with that but i have a sad amount of summer plans so i mean we can tr maybe can we is there a way of like using the doodle a uh, doodle poll to try and like see if we can have a if we can get if we get if we do it every two weeks to if we'll get a quorum? Okay, so then we have I mean we have a bunch of people missing tonight. Yep. Already That's that we don't too. know about. Yep. Okay. You can talk about scheduling. I'm sorry to interrupt. You yeah. can talk about scheduling among a quorum as much as you want. You can have okay. emails that are just about scheduling. As long as you're not talking about substantive matters, that's okay. fine. So is there objection to me attempting to schedule three or four meetings over the summer? I don't want to, right? I don't want to go about doing that if people are like, right. no, you're crazy. Um, so please speak now. Otherwise, I will attempt to do that. Okay, great. Um. Before, just oh, before Doug, Bob had I, something, Bob had something. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Bob. Yeah. I, I look at my calendar and I say, yeah, that's no problem. But, you know, things happen and I wouldn't want to commit and you rely on me being the last member of the quorum that you need. So, yeah, I, I think, mean, I would, say, yes, I could do anything, but don't, yep. don't count yep. on me. Yeah. Yeah, we'll make sure we're not scheduling for a bear quorum, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> um, okay. yep, thank you. And uh, just a quick question. So if the, in the summer it's more about investigating questions, you know, doing research that we don't have to make a decision to vote on anything, then no. basically I think it's gonna be fine. And yes. then, you know, when we have to make the decision, we need to make sure that, you know, by September we're all back in, that's when we start, you know. Yes, I think this is, what to, to my mind, right, this is about, gathering information, right? Providing, um, you know, input or, and or help to Clarissa as she feels she may need it as she's starting to, you know, put the first community thing together, right? And and then, you know, having things ready to go for the fall. With you, Sanjay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, I'm just providing a little bit of input. Anyway, yep. Great. Um, before, I, I do want to hear from Doug, but before we do that, I just wanted to like, just in terms of and this isn't like set in stone, but looking at what other topics are a part of this investigation that we don't have covered yet. If Doug is, you had said at some point, you've got some collected information about other, what other towns like us or somewhat comparable are doing. Is that something like how much could someone take that? And like, would someone need to do further research? What, where, or can we just ask you to talk to us about that? I in, can do any at number some things. meeting this summer. Yeah, if you just wanted a memo summarizing what Cambridge, Brookline, um, Somerville's in the process of reviewing their own their own process. process. What 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 the new Boston? Uh, I actually have a piece of that in uh, the presentation if you okay. want to have it tonight. But what the new Boston uh, Office of Police, oh, I'm going to get wrong, accountability and transparency looks like. Um, yeah, I mean, th th there's not going to be a ton of, as I think Carlos found, there's not a ton of directly right. comparable communities of this size because most of the communities are going to have a police force that's significantly larger. 
right? So you're talking, you know, somewhere between 200 and, right. you know, if you're in New York City, 30,000 police officers, you have a very different um, scale. Uh, I don't, I think maybe it's like Pittsfield and a few other smaller cities in Massachusetts, but Brookline's probably the closest. And I, I don't think folks will find that, well, I don't want to interject my opinion, but I'll, I'll, I'll save that. Okay, so we will put that on a future agenda. Um, so yeah, I would love to hear what you got, what you and Clarissa had ready. You're muted. If I can share my screen. Um, yeah, I think I need to, do I need to give you permission for that? Yes, please. Uh, can someone remind me where I do that? Security? Did that work? Yep. Okay. Um, okay, so let me move this. Uh, I've got it on my computer. Uh, Clarissa, you and I didn't really get a chance to like do a rehearsal, but um, let's, uh, but, but just jump in wherever, wherever you want. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to, there we go. So uh, Clarissa and I were asked to look at um, the audit or monitoring model of uh, civilian advisory uh, boards or civilian review boards. Um, we sort of relabeled it the audit and performance evaluation model uh, to try to capture the universe of these types of boards uh, throughout the country. Just a quick uh, affirmation of what a lot of folks have been talking about. I think a common source that people have been looking at is the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement. Um, and one of the things they note is that oversight systems take a wide variety of forms uh, and operate under a wide range of authorities and that the oversight agency's mission should bear some relationship to the size of the police department, the department's funding levels, level of trust or mistrust in the community, particularly among those segments of the community that historically have been subject to over-policing or bias-based policing. So I think that's affirming for what a lot of folks here are trying to get at, um, for what we've been talking about with respect to uh, the many good things that people have acknowledged tonight about our police department um, and, and the reality that we're trying to find something that's a right fit for Arlington, not just copy what somebody else is doing. Just a quick word on data and sources. Um, some of the things we looked at um, are a little bit to be frank, dated. Um, the National Association of Civilian Oversight and Law Enforcement is a great resource, but a lot of their data relies on the 2005 Police Assessment Resource Center. So just wanna have that disclaimer that there's obviously been a tremendous amount of activity within the last year and a half with respect to um, updating and revising some of these different forms of civilian review. Um, also looked at uh, citizen review of police approaches and implementation, which is the Department of Justice National Institute of Justice report. Did look at the Somerville draft of the civilian oversight of police in Somerville preliminary analysis report. Um, I personally disagree with some of the assessments of, of how they categorized some of these models. I don't know how important that is, but I just want to note that that some of it's difficult because some of these examples don't fit perfectly into one model or another. Then I also looked at, um, uh, personally, I looked at Human Rights Watch because while the data there is a little bit older as well, um, they talk about things like the St. Clair Commission in Boston, um, which again, I think should just give everybody a frame of reference for how much work goes into these things and the hard work that all of you guys are doing. I mean, that, that particular um, commission uh, had a longer timeline, more resources, obviously a different circumstance and a larger police department um, and, and, and larger community to sort of interface with. But um, I just wanted to know that these are some of the data and sources. And, and, and again, some of this stuff is a little bit dated. So there's basically uh, four-ish models of civilian review. Um, I say ish because some of them sort of straddle the line between one or another. Some might break it down into five or six. Some might say it's only three. But I won't go into a lot of detail, but there's the investigative or quality assurance model. This is basically, you know, where you have some sort of civilian, investi uh, civilian investigators and usually some kind of board 
um, that is going to go out and independently receive and investigate complaints, make findings, interview police officers, all that kind of stuff. Um, it's more of a specific focus on individual complaints. Uh, and it's usually parallel to internal police investigations. So San Francisco, New York City, Cincinnati, and one half of the new Boston Office of Police Accountability and Transparency is oriented towards that model. Then there's an appeal model, which is really complaints um, or uh, complainants or sometimes police personnel appeal an internal police department finding or recommendation to some kind of civilian. Um, this is again going to be specifically focused on individual complaints. It always is going to have an after internal police investigations and the disciplinary decision. So this is kind of how Brookline works. So Brookline basically has an internal affairs, reaches a decision. And uh, Chief Flaherty, if you're familiar with, with this, please feel free to chime in. Well, obviously Clarissa, of course. Uh, and then there's an appeal to their select board if the uh, determination is not basically satisfactory um, to the complainant. Uh, they have a different form of government, even though it looks very similar to ours. They have a town administrator um, and a strong select board that makes hires and fires, um, which is different than ours. Our select board only really hires and fires a very limited uh, range of folks, really just the town manager at this point. There's a review model, which is very, very similar to some of these other models. And that's also focused on individual complaints, but after internal police investigations and before the disciplinary decision is reached. Um, this isn't a perfect fit, but this the Cambridge Police Review and Advisory Board kind of fits into this model, Kansas City, Detroit. Um, and then finally, there's this auditor and evaluative performance model where the main goal of the auditor monitor paradigm is to investigate the processes by which internal investigations examine complaint, report on the thoroughness and fairnesses of the processes um, to both police department and the public and make policy recommendations. So this has a broader scope than really focusing on um, more individual investigation or review of specific incidents or complaints. Um, it tends to also be parallel or after police investigation internally is complete. And um, some examples of this are the, the Denver Office of the Independent Monitor, one half of the other half of the Boston Police uh, Accountability and Transparency Office, uh, Albuquerque, San Jose, um, and a, another example that I'll highlight at the end of this. So the auditor model um, does some of the following things. It does complaint intake quality control. So one of the things that auditors are concerned about is are complaints, are, are complaints accessible? Do people have the ability to file complaints? Do they have uh, translation needs met? Do they feel safe? Can they feel like they can file a complaint without retaliation? Another thing that they're focused on is assessing the fairness and completeness of a complaint investigation. So they're gonna have access to the internal investigation files so that they can review and decide, hey, we thought this was a good investigation. They're also gonna have access to data collection analysis to examine uh, trends in police data. So they wanna know, um, look, we're getting a lot of excessive force complaints. What's going on here? We need to look further at this and figure out uh, why this is happening so that they can uh, identify policy and practice concerns. Is there, are there issues on supervision, training, or uh, the discipline that's being meted out that suggests that uh, either the police department or other managing authorities aren't on top of what they need to be on top of? They might offer alternative dispute resolution, um, which surprised me a little bit. Uh, and they do a lot of public reporting and commenting. Some of them have forums and things like that. Some of them make quarterly reports, some of it's more annually. What does alternative dispute resolution mean? So that means like um, someone filed an internal affairs complaint um, rather than just having it result in discipline or not discipline, there might be an opportunity for a civilian uh, complainant to meet with an officer, talk with them about um, the incident. I mean, obviously this isn't- Oh, I see, yeah, I understand. It's not gonna work in every, every circumstance and situation. No, and it's in- and it's also arbitration uh, in a different way from the completely rigid um, enforcement of, of 
what we're talking about before, but it, it, it allows a little more flexibility. Yeah, exactly. thank you. I understand what you're talking about now. I, yep. Um, so some things that the audit model does not generally do, it doesn't perform investigations. It doesn't advocate for individual complainants, except for things like access, right? Like I need to have, I, I, I wanna file a complaint, but I need translation services or, um, you know, I, I need, you know, a safe space to file a complaint, something like that. It does not meet out discipline. Although it's important to note that almost none of these models do. Um, we can talk about that some later point down the road uh, on the investigative model after uh, we, we've had a discussion about that model specifically. And it doesn't focus usually on individual outcomes. There are some exceptions, but. Um, so the assets of the audit or performance evaluation, basically how well professional standards is performing their job in a community like Arlington. Uh, which gaps are basically filled? Well, there's a sort of gap that's filled about saying, okay, we feel like we've got some independent examination of the quality of disciplinary decisions. You're monitoring the efficacy of internal affairs or professional standards in Arlington. Um, are there findings and recommendations? Oh, I'm sorry, it looks like I left something out there. Clarissa, do you remember what that was? Uh, are there findings and recommendations, you know, uh, basically, based on quality evidence and, and, and consistent with the transgression or policy violation. Um, sorry. Uh, they uh, also uh, tend to focus on the complaint and investigative process. So it might identify and address problems in the complaint filing process or options, as well as the investigative steps or procedures. Did the professional standards folks not talk to witnesses at the scene? Did they, you know, uh, uh, afford too much credit to officer sort of uh, recitation of events, stuff like that. It might uh, well address any gaps in training that contributed to complaints and or policy violations. Those aren't the same thing. Sometimes there's a gap in training that, com that, that might uh, lead to complaints, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a policy violation committed. And we don't necessarily want complaints, we, even if it's not a policy violation. So this is gonna be pretty long-term reform oriented and it's gonna identify where individual circumstances or data trends reveal training or policy needs and failures. Um, I guess I already said this, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, fairness and consistency in disciplinary investigation and outcomes. What you don't want is variation, right? If two officers do the same thing, you shouldn't have wildly different uh, investigations and disciplinary outcomes. And then finally, you know, Public reporting is something that's a strength of the auditing uh, or performance evaluation model. Uh, this information and the auditing is supposed to be used to further transparency, enhance community police dialogues and inspire confidence. I'm kind of moving kind of fast, but I just know that we're short on time. Uh, some uh, of this model's liabilities, gaps that are unfilled. This is an advisory, these are advisory bodies in nature. Uh, They're not usually case specific. So if there's, you know, a specific um, incident and people don't feel like there's a just outcome, the auditing model is not a model that's going to reverse uh, a decision or an outcome and say, you know, you're supposed to, you were supposed to reach this different decision, change this decision in this specific case. Um, it's got a long-term focus, which can be great, but it's not necessarily meant to uh, be based again on one specific incident it's more oriented towards we're gathering data, we're looking at a body of work by professional standards, we're identifying strengths and weaknesses in the way uh, a police department is uh, doing its internal investigations and discipline. Um, and then finally, it, it requires some expertise. It's not super easy. I mean, I don't wanna say that this is necessarily a challenge in Arlington, but it's not super easy. You've gotta have some people that are sort of data savvy um, who might be willing to look at data on the aggregate, who might mm -hmm. have some ideas about how to, uh, what data points to collect from audited um, uh, internal affairs uh, cases. Um, so this is just a model case study uh, from Tucson, Arizona. And the reason I think it's really interesting is that this actually isn't a body, it's a professional position, a police auditor and a civilian investigator but there's not really a reason why it couldn't be a body. So this is um, 
basically their sort of Q&A about what is the IPA. So it's an external source to audit citizen complaint investigations conducted by the Tucson police. The purpose is to determine if an investigation was complete, thorough, objective, and fair. Uh, and it's supposed to be a resource uh, regarding police actions and standards. So, I mean, I think when you should file a complaint is pretty clear. Walks through how you should file a complaint. Um, but, and then it talks about what happens. Well, the purpose of the, this particular body is again, not to um, say that they're gonna reverse an outcome of internal affairs. It's if you're not satisfied with the outcome, you should uh, file a complaint. We should be examining this and um, determining whether we think we're getting quality um, internal affairs work or in Arlington, we call it professional standards out of our police department. Uh, what they say is, does my complaint make a difference? Citizen complaints assist the police department to identify problems with officers and department policies. And then they also uh, sort of have an open invitation to engage in the community. Now, it's important to note this particular, um, so there's a copy of the complaint form. Um, this particular body is paired with something called the Police Advisory Review Board uh, in, um, in Tucson, which is really, um, which is really a, a version of the review model that I referenced earlier. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not a standalone thing. Obviously Tucson's a, a, a decent sized city, so they have more than one thing at once, but it's an interesting and very straightforward version of the audit or performance evaluation model. Now, another example, just to sort of close this out is the Boston Police Community Ombudsman Panel. And the reason I think this is still important is because Boston just um, did a pretty comprehensive evaluation of its own police review. Um, and they decided to make some pretty significant reforms and create a, a civilian complaint review board that probably is a little bit more similar to New York City. But they kept the community ombudsman panel. They renamed it uh, and, and, and had it be one of the two arms of that new office. But essentially what it does is it's independent from Boston Police Department uh, in its previous iteration it had three civilians with qualifications for the review role appointed by the mayor. And it basically had a hybrid audit and appeal function. So they did accept appeals of internal investigations whenever those internal investigations resulted in find, findings of unfounded, exonerated or not sustained if someone wanted to file an appeal. Uh, but they also conducted audits of a 10% sample of internal affairs cases. I'm not sure what's going on there. That's strange. All right, I'm sorry, Clarissa, I think I lost one of the slides, but um, <laughs> right. uh, so uh, again, the, 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 um, the sort of function there is to say, look, we're not just looking at individual appeals of a case. We wanna do a qualitative assessment to say how well uh, and how confident we are. And they can um, make recommendations for changes to police department policy, including how internal affairs conducts investigations and make larger recommendations. Now, I think it's fair to say that in Boston, they found that this wasn't uh, sufficient to, um, because the scope was just too narrow for what they feel like they need to do there. But um, this provides a good example and a basic summary of the uh, audit, um, audit performance evaluation sort of model of civilian review. Thanks folks. Thank you, Doug. And one of the things that we should be doing in all of this is once we come up with a model that, that we think is what we wanna go forward with is also put a price tag on it because that will be one of the most determinant um, questions of town meeting from the finance committee. And um, so I really thank Doug for all this hard work. I think it's, he's done a real, real service for us. And, um, you know, I look forward to you all that are gonna do the policy stuff over the summer. Doug, can you, um, are you able to share this with us? Oh yeah. Uh, Kathy asked that in the chat. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me do that right now. Okay. 
Thank you. Anybody have any questions they want to ask? About from of Doug and Clarissa. Carlos. Yeah, thank you very much, Doug. That's really fantastic. I so just one one point here is and all these bodies, how how do they get the authority to get the required information and data right from all this to to do the audit? You know, how what 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 kind of authority you know the, the, does this body have to have to get you know that, that that information from completed investigations or from police data or for you know from all these policies? How how, how do they get that? Yeah, so so most of these audit models have to have an ordinance or in our case a bylaw that establishes that they have the right to um, access certain information uh, that might be confidential and not mm -hmm. public otherwise. Um, and, you know, there's some important things about confidentiality and all that kind of stuff, uh, but that would, that would go along. I mean, the Human Rights Commission is familiar with a lot of the obligations that come along with something like that. So that wouldn't be uh, too difficult um, in the sense that you just have to codify that they have um, access to that information, and you obviously want, you know, uh, cooperation from uh, the police department and, and and all that kind of stuff to be a sort of hallmark of of what you're embodying here. Um, by the way, I'm trying to figure out how to put this in the chat. Maybe folks have a better idea how to do it. I think it's just a large file, um, so I can email it to everybody. I'm sorry, I don't. I'd prefer if you could email it, Doug, if that's possible. Yep. I, I just want to add, as the member of the Human Rights Commission, that um, I understand we, too, have some bylaw about getting information. Having mm -hmm. the bylaw and having it work has been two different things. And so part of it is um, personnel issues. There's privacy issues and collective bargaining agreements. There's that. So whatever mode that we choose, I know I'm going to be taking particular interest in making sure that this entity can be effective by getting the information it needs and codifying that and making sure it's not vague. Sanjay? One of the th hard th hardest things about Sanjay this. Sanjay had his hand up, Clarissa. Sorry. I'm sorry. Um, no, no, I had a separate point. So can, okay. let's continue on this point and then, yep. Sure. I just think it's important to realize that we have police unions and this is a subject that we haven't brought up before that poor Julie Flaherty has to deal with every day. And I think that the union <clears throat> overlay in this is something that we have to consider. Excuse me, Sanjay. No, no, not at all. Um, uh, if there are more about this particular topic, I'm, I'm happy to wait. Um, so I, I was going to ask, you had mentioned in the Tucson case um, that their auditor was, uh, it sounded like a, a single person, a single staff position. Is, was that a, did I hear that correctly? Um, okay. So yeah, it's, it's an office. There. Uh, there, there were other models where, it's like the community ombudsman panel, in sure. Boston. But in, in in Tucson, it's a professional staff member. Um, you know, it, again, I, I think some of it depends on. You know, we've talked about this a little bit. Um, in Boston, you've got a pretty yep. large pool of folks to draw from. I mean, in Arlington, you've got a pretty large pool of professionals to draw from too. But but yeah, it's it varies from municipality to municipality. Yeah. Okay. But but I, I guess what I was sort of saying I was surprised. Was that office like how many people were in that office in Tucson? Well, at Do least we, two. Um, I, I'm not sure. I could do a little bit more digging on that. Okay. I, yeah. Yeah. Right. I, I'm just trying to right for myself understand sort of the sense of scale, right? For for other larger communities, right? What's the what's the scale that other communities have so that we can be thinking about that, you know, when we adjust that scale to ourselves? 
Yeah, I mean, Cambridge, that has, that's a good point. I mean, Cambridge has a different model, but I'm pretty sure that they have like a position and a half for what they do. Um, I know that the, I know that we've been trying to reach out to them to, to see if they can provide us some insight on their, their process and their resources, but it's an important question. So um, thank you again. I think we should adjourn in a minute, but I just to make sure we're clear on what our next steps are. Um, several of us have individual assignments. Clarissa is gonna move forward with um, talking to members of the faith community with an introduction from Sanjay. Um, Jill and I are gonna try to do some work on methods of complaint. Um, and Sanjay is going to continue on his investi in investigating investigatory bodies. Um, and we will try to meet with three or four times before September. That, am I forgetting anything? OK, can someone make a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second, um, I'm gonna take, I'll take the vote. Uh, Sanjay? Yes. Carlos? Yes. Michael? Yes. Clarissa? Do I need a voice on this, Doug? Yes. Okay, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Elliot? Yes. Uh, Bob, who I almost called Joyce? Yes. <laughs> uh, Kathy. Yes. Okay. Uh, I think that's it for voting members. Um, so we are now adjourned. Thank you all. Good night, Thanks, folks. Have a good night. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.